My name is Ian Watt. I work at Rubini Global Economics, uh, which is a macroeconomic research shop um, run by Nuriel Rubini, uh, the economist you may or may not be aware of. Um, and I work on a team that, as, as Stuart said, is you know, we, what we call Country Insights, um, which essentially is a quantitative risk model uh, that evaluates uh, strengths and vulnerabilities around the world. We cover 174 countries. Um, and we combine that with, actually, we have about 40 economists at, at RGE that um, evaluate kind of the 40 main economies and regions and asset classes around the world. So we essentially combine you know, quantitative data with our qualitative understanding uh, of policy moves coming you know, down the pipeline. Um, we then combine that information together with market prices to have kind of directional recommendations to our clients about markets uh, around the world. Um, so one, one thing that we've been trying to figure out how to do well um, actually is assess political risk. So when we were put in contact with the people at Ravenpack, um, we were actually, and I personally was quite interested in figuring out how we could actually use this uh, news data to measure in real time uh, political risk. So our current model, you know, this quantitative uh, measurement is, is very much structural in nature. So we have a way of evaluating political risk um, by looking at things like government effectiveness, uh, political rights, rule of law, uh, indeed looking at data, from, you know, crime, terrorism, refugee data. Um, but that is very, you know, by nature, slow-moving information. Um, you know, it moves on a quarterly basis at best, sometimes yearly basis, uh, depending on the data sources that we're looking at. And it gives us a, a, a first-pass understanding of, of political vulnerabilities, but really isn't up to speed on things that are, you know, developing in real time. Um, as was mentioned, Ukraine is a, an example. Thailand, obviously, there are a lot of issues um, regarding political rights there. Um, so we tend to rely on our qualitative coverage to kind of supplement that structural model of, of political risk, um, which is interesting. We can kind of look at policy direction, so we'll have a view on what, you know, we think uh, the election outcomes might be in Brazil this year. We can apply that to our understanding of political rights in Brazil. Um, and then we can also incorporate views of market participants to kind of see essentially where we differ from, from the market. Um, but the problem with that qualitative understanding, you know, the kind of real-time qualitative understanding is that it's idiosyncratic in nature. So it is very much based on the analyst who's covering Brazil for our, for our company, um, who could, you know, for good reason, could differ quite dramatically from other analysts at other companies, um, or indeed could view political risk quite differently than, you know, other, other analysts within our own company. So essentially what we're looking to do with Ravenpack is to provide a up-to-date real-time assessment of political risk around the world um, that is very much quantitative in nature that kind of takes the analysts idiosyncratic judgment out of it um, but then also supplements these kind of structural measures that we already incorporate into our model um, so to do that essentially we're and I should actually preface this by mentioning that this is a completely different package. What we're, the, the Raven Pack data that we're using is actually quite different from the, uh, the, the Raven Pack data that's been presented previously. They're, those presentations are looking at equities packages. So we're not looking at equity data at all in this, actually. We're looking at their macro package, um, which I'm sure any of the representatives can give you a, a much better a detailed description of what that means. But essentially, it's looking not at news data related to specific companies, but rather news data related to each country around the world. Um, so we are extracting data from the database, the Ravenpack database, that looks at uh, politics in general. It's a very kind of uh, high-level description uh, of, those, of those news articles. Um, within the economics topic, so they have another topic, uh, economics, uh, we're looking at public finance information. We're, we're basically assuming that public finance related articles have an implication, um, an impact on political risk. And finally, looking within their kind of society measures, looking at civil unrest as a component of what we're describing as political risk. Um, obviously, there's a fair amount of subjectivity that's involved with, with selecting these three uh, definitions of political risk. Um, but for our initial purposes, these seem to be the ones that kind of adequately capture what we mean when we say political risk. So um, for the macro package, they do have the same kind of indicators. Um, that have been presented previously. So we do have an event sentiment for each piece of news that comes out for each country around the world. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, essentially a novelty factor. 
So if that's the first article being written about um, you know, budget deficits in Italy, um, or if it's the 15th, so it gets a different weighting essentially. Um, and then finally we have a, a type of article, so whether it's a hot news flash, if there's breaking news coming out of Thailand um, versus just a, a standard news article or a, indeed a press release. Um, and then finally we kind of we aggregate all of those, uh, those factors together, um, essentially you know, taking positive sentiment versus negative sentiment on the day um, for each article for each country, um, kind of modifying it by the novelty of that article. Um, and then the type of article, and then we sum that together to get a daily political risk score for each country uh, around the world. Um, so obviously we don't want to just describe, you know, if there's a huge news blast on uh, a, a singular day, um, we need a way to kind of describe the, the salience, the decay of that salience over time. So we use just a very simplistic uh, exponential decay function uh, with a predetermined time constant. Um, for the purposes of this experiment we used, well, we looked at a number of different time windows, but uh, we found the 60-day time window actually to um, be the, the strongest fit between essentially our qualitative understanding of what political risk was in, in the various countries that we assessed and the quantitative measure uh, thereof. And then finally, once we get that kind of uh, the daily score decayed over time, um, we then compute z-scores to allow us to kind of uh, draw cross-country uh, implications to compare the different countries. So we started with Italy. That was our initial spot because essentially our, our structural model it didn't get Italy very well, actually. Um, the institutions are quite strong in Italy. Um, the political rights are strong. Voice and accountability is quite strong. Yet political risk in Italy is perhaps, you know, at least during the crisis period, was perhaps one of the most important things to be able to measure. Um, so what I did is I actually asked our Italian economist, uh, Bruno La Rosa, to actually sit down without knowing at all what I was doing with Ravenpack, uh, to actually sit down and um, essentially chart out on a scale from zero to five the kind of peaks and troughs of political risk, which is what you see in these kind of step functions here um, from his perspective. And then I mapped that to what our, essentially our quantitative model was saying using the Ravenpack data, which is what you see obviously in the dark blue line there. Um, and you can see there's, there's some interesting, you know, uh, correlations, in the, in the, at least in the initial period. And there's a very noticeable gap right in the middle. Um, so we see the kind of the peak right before the, the Berlusconi resignation or right during the, the Berlusconi resignation. Um, but what's important to note actually from this is that um, the balanced budget law was actually discussed in Italian press and, and within parliament um, back in the summer of 2011, um, whereas the, it actually wasn't signed into law until November. So we see that there are some things that, it's, that the Raven Pack information is actually picking up. Um, in real time, it's, avoid, it's missing some of the kind of foreign language press, um, but we're not expecting it to pick up necessarily uh, in all of the Italian uh, press. But most importantly, in the middle, we see actually um, the kind of easy dissolution fears take over, which is, as our Italian economist points out, um, more of an international political risk. So we don't actually, in fact, expect a, a query that's looking at just Italian politics to pick that up. Um, and then finally, we see kind of a tapering off um, towards, I guess, I guess that was August of 2012, uh, when Draghi presents his do-whatever-it-takes speech from the ECB. Um, and indeed, we do see kind of a leveling off after that uh, period in time. So that's looking at Italy. Um, we wanted to not only assess, and I think, that, I mean, that's, from my perspective, this adds some additional information um, to what we currently have from a quantitative perspective. Um, obviously, it's not as involved as our Italian economists who knows, is reading the Italian press daily um, and knows exactly when there's going to be a standoff in Parliament. Um, but we do, as I mentioned before, we cover 174 countries from our quantitative model, uh, and there's no way that we'll have that sort of uh, granular insight into all of those countries. Um, without the assistance of something like Raven Pack. So from my perspective, this is, is, uh, is quite a good result. Um, moving away from developed markets, um, we actually wanted to run this for Egypt as well. Um, I think this maps fairly well uh, as well. Um, obviously, the beginning of the Arab Spring protest is widely covered in the media. We see a huge spike in political risk, um, which indeed correlates, maps right to our uh, Egyptian economist's view of political risk in that country. Um, see kind of a leveling off until the summer of, of 2012, 
um, when Morsi is named the new Egyptian president, um, where we actually see a, a quite a strong spike again in risk. So again, just to rephrase, um, we're looking at sentiment scores. So it's actually not only just telling us that there's a lot of news coming out um, about you know, Egyptian political risk, but indeed is providing a quantitative score on a scale from 0 to 100, 0 being bad, 100 being good. So we can actually get kind of granular information um, and then can see relative to each other these different spikes. So when there's you know, higher risk in the initial Arab Spring protests versus um, the coup leading to Morsi's ouster uh, earlier this year. So we wanted a way to, well, I wanted a way to kind of um, establish essentially a control variable to map this. You know, we see all these spikes in the developing world, emerging world. Um, but I wanted to see what uh, U.S. political risk looks like. And I mean, from my perspective, this seems to make somewhat sense. We're actually at a kind of a global low for political risk at this stage um, in the beginning of 2014. Um, according to the, the CBO, the budget deficit has narrowed sharply. Um, but we see the peak back in uh, 2011 that the annual budget deficit was uh, 1.29 trillion, the second highest on record. So that's driving, again, we're looking at public finance as part of our description, uh, our definition of political risk. So it is pulling in um, that information. You see other spikes as well uh, related to uh, some of the, uh, the Wall Street protests um, later in that year. But you can see in the background, we then map that to emerging markets. And we see kind of an interesting, uh, some interesting peaks here. So again, going back to the beginning of Arab Spring, we see how that's an, you know, an extraordinary event in many ways. So again, these are z-scores compared to the, the history, the historical scores for each of those countries. So Arab Spring, you know, I could make a case for the fact that that was a kind of a once in a generation event. Um, we see Berlusconi's resignation standing out for Italy. Um, but we also see kind of on a relative basis, we can see the Gezi Park protests in Istanbul actually peaking out there as well. Um, and then obviously the, the Euro Maiden riots in Ukraine. I didn't update this. Um, this is up until I think two weeks ago. So I would expect actually that Ukrainian uh, chart there, that line chart to actually have peaked or ha have spiked actually pretty significantly leading up to this weekend. Um, and I will, when I get to the office, Tomorrow we'll run this, you know, make sure I'll check the, the scores and see what uh, it has done since, uh, since yesterday. Um, so this is essentially how we're thinking about incorporating this type of information. Again, it's very different from the previous presentations. We're not necessarily in the business of constructing portfolios. We actually use this as part of a signal um, of our broader model. Uh, which then you know, asset managers will, will use to, to define their strategies or as an input to their strategies. Um, but from my perspective, this is quite an interesting result. And, and realistically, what it allows us to do is kind of look at these other countries that we might not, not, might not cover in depth um, on a day-to-day -day basis. We can use this essentially as a, a signal to let us know when we should really start paying attention to some of these, these other countries. Um, so I will leave, that, leave it there for, I guess, some questions. Um, as I promised, I, it, it was a very short presentation. Any questions? Mm-hmm. Hello. Uh, I was wondering how difficult is it to assess the sentiment uh, in relationship to political risk? Because to me, it seems that it's a very different kettle of fish than for equities, where what sounds positive is positive, usually. Yeah. And the assessment of actual sentiment here, in my opinion, is much trickier business. So how do you experience that? Yeah, well, <laughs> essentially, we take the event sentiment score as given from Ravenpack. So they actually produce that. Their algorithms produce that. And perhaps you know, someone from Ravenpack would be better positioned to answer how they produce that ultimate sentiment score. Um, but I think it, you know, the, the kind of intellectual property that we're, we're imparting on this essentially is figuring out what is our definition of uh, political risk. So you can see from you know, the, the civil unrest, obviously, those are going to be skewed towards the negative. Um, so their actual, their algorithm producing that event sentiment score is always going to be on the downside. Um, you can make a case for, you know, budget deficits or budget surpluses. That's, you know, obviously you can, th there's a binary function there. Obviously surplus is better than deficit. Um, but 
how they get between 50, a score of 50 and 100 on a, a, budget, a budget surplus, I wouldn't be able to comment on that, unfortunately. And the, the signals from a qualitative analysis was very different from mm -hmm. the opposite. Right. Quantitative, so I was curious how internally you, you have that debate. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, we use the two, the two approaches essentially to, as a cross-check for the other. Um, so again, looking back at Italy, I think the main reason for that that big spike there is really because of the fact that it's international political risk. It's not associated necessarily with Italy. So if we were, to, I don't know if there's an entity, an easy entity in the macro package. Is there? Um, we we um, obviously the first thing would be to to match individual countries. Um, yeah. The next the next thing would be to to do it at the at the eurozone level. Do you have an and entity there, for there eurozone? Are entity, yeah. There okay. are entities that don't have countries and they have. Uh, give it an XX, so they're yeah. international organizations, and one of them is, is the Eurozone as okay. an entity and the ECB, so, yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, so you can pick that up. Yeah. There are other, like the mon monetary uh, unions and so that are, that are also with the country called XX. Okay, that's quite interesting. Yeah, that's how I would, I would definitely take that next step, you know, especially in, in reference to Italy or any of the periphery countries. I mean, we actually did map this to uh, BTP boon spreads as well. Um, and the correlation is quite high right up into that, basically into the Draghi speech. Um, so that's where we really see the kind of political risk becomes less necessary, less of an impact on, on asset prices. Um, so again, that would be interesting to, to actually apply kind of a, you know, a, a international organization level uh, data onto it. Any other questions? Yeah, there's one in the back there. I was wondering, uh, two questions actually. Mm -hmm. One being, uh, as events this weekend pointed out, the absolute unpredictability of certain political events. Right. And is there a utility in trying to attach a quantitative score when, in fact, sometimes things are just completely unpredictable? Secondly, uh, what is your experience, RE, the Arab Spring? Did you find that there were any commonalities mm -hmm. in how they scored relative to how events uh, unfolded? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so I, I mean, I think there is, there is definitely value in not necessarily saying that we're going to predict based on this quantitative data, but um, actually having an understanding of the relative degrees of risk uh, across countries. So that kind of leads into your, your second question. Um, with this exercise, we did not actually map out other Arab Spring countries. Um, but in our quantitative model that, you know, that, that we have in-house, uh, the Country Insights model that I work on, um, essentially we, do, we did find that there were some common features um, you know, that, we, that we do measure in other categories. So looking at social elements, looking at some of the structural political uh, factors that, that we describe. So um, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not able to show you a slide that looks at the, the various Arab Spring countries, but I think that would be an interesting uh, new avenue. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for one more if there is one question. Okay? Good. Thank you very much, Ian. That was really very interesting. Thank you.